It's time to talk Gonzaga basketball. Get ready. It's the Spoke Review Zags Insiders Podcast. Here we go. Here's Jim Meehan and Richard Fox. Good Monday morning. Welcome back to the Zags Basketball Insiders Podcast. Jim Meehan, Richard Fox with you for another half hour or so. Big week coming for Gonzaga coming up here. This is uh, kind of the one, you know, people have been pointing to for a while. Zags at San Francisco in the Chase Center and at St. Mary's to close the regular season. This one will determine a lot of things. Seeding in the tournament. Uh, outside, outside shot at, at a, a co-championship. That looks pretty unlikely, but that second seed has a lot of value. Uh, and then obviously the at-large implications. If the Zags win both, maybe they uh, go from last team in just, just outside into uh, a more secure spot come Selection Sunday. But we'll get to all that. But let's uh, get set up on where the Zags are right now in the national picture. Uh, at 21 in the net rankings, which uh, I think we've pointed out a few times, the, uh, if you're in the 20s, I don't think there's ever been a team that hasn't made the, uh, the tournament. I think that starts in the 33 range or something to that effect where they uh, missed out on the tournament. So that's probably a good sign. Their metrics are, are good. Uh, the problem is, is that, that they still have uh, a lot of doubters in terms of quad one. Uh, their actual resume, and that's something they can address this week. These are two quad one games coming uh, later in the week, so we'll see what happens there. And the brackets, uh, I think uh, Joe Lenardi tweeted out that the Zags are now the second to last team in. Or no, excuse me, they are the last team in. Wake Forest vaulted up past them into the second to last team in. Wouldn't that be a, an interesting 11 <laughs> on 11 matchup in uh, Dayton? What do you think, Foxy? <laughs> I, th- I think I think that story writes itself. <laughs> uh, we I looked up some others. Uh, the Zags are an 11 seed with Jerry Palm, uh, CBS Sports. I think he has them playing Old Miss in Dayton, and then uh, Mike DeCourcy with Fox Sports. Uh, if you don't read Mike, you need to read Mike. He's a very good uh, uh, analyst of college basketball, but he. He has his eggs as a 10 seed. Same seed line as Boise State would be a 10 in, in Mike's bracket. So kind of gives you a feel for where the Zags are coming into this next week. Um, the tournament, the WCC tournament, best I can tell, I think the Zags secure the second seed, and that gets you all the way into the semifinals, if, if they win one game, either game this mm-hmm. week. And San Fran loses one game, either game this week same same uh, same result uh and don't forget san francisco's got to play santa clara and uh, mm-hmm. that won't be an easy one either so all these teams uh, especially gonzaga and san francisco have a lot of work to do this week uh so we'll see how that turns out let's go back through last week last week real quick zags went on the road they played at portland uh you know shante leggan since he's been uh, the pilots head coach the last three years he has uh, kind of given GU uh, an open look at the three-point line uh, for the most part. And Zags have punished them with uh, 15, 17, and 18 in, uh, threes in the last uh, three home games. And then Strother had that 40-point night down in, in Portland last year with, with eight threes. Wasn't quite like that this year. They still got open looks. Ben Gregg still hit uh, three threes, I believe. I think Nolan hit four or five <laughs> more. But mm-hmm. it was more... Gonzaga's inside game uh, all around game they got out and ran a little bit uh, I think Shante kind of tweaked his his philosophy there a little bit they, and they were missing a big kid in the middle that had been starting for him but uh, you, you saw the same things I did that uh, that they've been doing in this winning streak you know Ryan Nemhard just controlling the game from the point guard position Nolan doing his thing uh, EK inside and the defense was was pretty good most of the way uh, I thought a pretty good indication of how things went for Portland is I looked at the box last night while I was preparing for this. I think they had two turnovers. Uh, mm-hmm. Unless I read that wrong, two turnovers, both turned into three balls for the Zags at the other end. So uh, what'd you see uh, uh, when you saw the Zags game uh, on television the other night, Foxy? 
Yeah, I, I just I thought it was, for lack of a better way to describe it, a workman like kind of performance. Um, I thought Gonzaga was really good offensively, moving the ball, twenty one assists on I believe thirty five field goals, made only six turnovers for the Zags. Obviously, Portland was great with the ball, but um, you know Gonzaga in its own right took care of it. Gonzaga just dominated them on the glass. You know, we we see that pretty consistently against the bottom five teams in the league for Gonzaga. It's just their their size and. Depth up front is just too much, and uh, Gonzaga plus 21. I thought they were good defensively for the most part, particularly inside the arc. Um, yeah. Portland was you know, minus uh, 38% inside the arc, but shot it well from three, 42%, uh, but only got 19 up. You know, I think Gonzaga did a decent job of getting them to you know, close it out and having those guys have to put it on the floor. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, um, you know, it, it just I, – I like this team's approach generally. I mean, they've been pretty consistent all year, Jim. I think you'd agree. You know, it's not as it, – it's – I'd have to, to, to think UP, uh, Pacific down in Stockton is the only game I can think of where it felt like maybe out of the gate they weren't quite ready to go. Yeah, exactly. But other, other, other than that, I think every night they just – they come in and they're ready to grind through whatever's – you know, whatever the game's going to be. And um and I stand corrected. Portland might, uh, under thirty five percent from inside the arc, so just really couldn't get anything going at the rim. And uh, even when they did get to the free throw line, they were you know they missed ten free throws. Did Portland so solid went on the road and happy to see guy you know Greg played really well, particularly in the first half. Obviously, it was fun to go back home and, and play in front of friends and family. So um, yeah, kind of what I expected. Yeah, business like just kind of. And, and Nolan Hickman said after the game that. Uh, uh, you know, now we can essentially, he said, we can turn our attention to Santa Clara because that, that was the game <laughs> that sticks in the craw of, of many of those players. Uh, I thought one other, real quick, one other promising sign, I guess we'll talk about that with Santa Clara. You kind of saw Stromer get back to his his uh, best days of the season a month or two ago before there was the switch in the starting lineup with Ben Gregg. Uh, I really saw him guarding, defending, Mm -hmm. rebounding hustling doing all those things that he did for a few months at the start of the year and and I think he's been trying obviously to keep doing them but uh, he's just been in a little bit of a funk lately and uh you saw that start to come out again um uh, uh, in that game and then carried it over to Santa Clara which uh I don't know about you Foxy when I watched those guys warm up and I went down and sat courtside because I I kind of wanted to, uh, uh, you know, be close to the floor with uh, Anton's special night going, but uh, that team is huge and yes, physical. They They've got five bigs. They may be the only team on the West Coast that has uh, more, <laughs> <laughs> more depth inside and, and actual physical size than the Zags. They got seven footers that are not thin. Those are big, no, no. strong kids. Tilly's. No. Uh, Tilly took guy off the bounce and laid it in, you know, about a 20 foot drive looked like Timmy used to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they're very impressive and they, they had their way in the first half. Those five, I think were 16 of 18 scored a bunch of points in the upper thirties. Maybe I think uh, maybe even 41 or something uh, for the first time. I felt like, uh, you know, Zags might be outnumbered in there, but, uh, the bottom line is Graham E.K. did what he does, 26 points. Anton got it going. Uh, Benny didn't score it a bunch, but, you know, he had his impact as well. And I thought the Zags were able to counter that a little bit. I thought their guard line, Nolan Hickman, Ryan Nemhart outplayed Santa Clara's. And they've got a good guard line as well. Yep. Uh, Napper, who hurt Gonzaga down there. Ball, who hit the game winner, scored 17. Carlos Marshall is a very nice player. Uh, I don't think those guys scored till the second half, or if they did, they might have had two points. Uh, Ball and Marshall, the top two scores, might have had two points at half, something like that. But uh, that was a pretty, uh, a pretty impressive team to watch in terms of depth, physical, uh, physicalness, and the Zags handled it pretty well. That uh, that was kind of a team effort to get by those guys. Yeah, no, they are enormous. One of the biggest teams in the country is Santa Clara. And quite frankly, they're a good team. Um, yeah. I think they've had some unfortunate injuries. Um, they, they've dropped a game or two that they certainly would want to have back. But on balance, it's not a team. I mean, look, I don't think Gonzaga's breathing a sigh of relief if they see them in the semifinals. 
And that's a team that can beat you. They, they've obviously done that before, but um, you know, even had Gonzaga won down at Santa Clara, I think we'd both be you know, impressed with with who Santa Clara is. So, um, you know, another good game, you know, for Gonzaga with respect to taking care of the ball, only eight eight turnovers, 17 assists on 34 field goals made, shot it really, really well. Um, you know, against that Santa Clara size, I thought Gonzaga did a much better job competing. You know, mm-hmm. Santa Clara was plus one on the glass overall, um, plus five on the offensive glass, but Gonzaga actually had more second chance points than Santa Clara. So even, when, even though Santa Clara really, um, you know, had the advantage on the offensive glass, wasn't able to convert. And, mm-hmm. you know, Santa Clara around the rim shot less than 49% versus Gonzaga almost 60. So I thought it was a really good response. You know, you noted um, in, your, in your email this morning about, or last night about ahead of the podcast that, Guys were uns- unsolicited. Were bringing up the game. They, mm-hmm. they, they were. I don't think the staff struggled to get this group's attention for Saturday night. And uh, yeah, it's, I just thought it was. That's a really good Santa Clara team. Um, I know from a national perspective, it may not get the same attention as it should. But you know, Gonzaga's plus seven points off turnovers, plus ten on the on the break. Just kind of just did was solid all across the board with respect to what you need to do to win a game like that. Um, and to your point about Stromer, I mean, look, over the weekend, um, you know, he's playing about 24, 25 minutes a game, you know, averaging almost nine, and more importantly, shooting it effectively and confidently, 7-11 from the field, three of six from the free throw, uh, three-point line, getting rebounds, averaging four. He was really good against Santa Clara. I mean, a huge spark off the bench. You know, had 10 points, four or five from the field. And I think your point about his defense is on is a good one. Um, he can come in and you can go smaller with your lineup and keep Nemhard or Hickman out. But I think more importantly, you could bring him in if either one of those guys, you see an opportunity as a staff to get them off the floor to, to, to rest or they have some foul trouble issue. I think there's some growing confidence that he can come in and not hurt you on either end. He can hold up defensively, and then offensively, if he's open, he can knock down the the, the open shot. So, um, you know, look, I've been saying this for a while now, and I think I think it still holds water. If Gonzaga's aspirations in March are going to be largely driven, um, or if not entirely dependent on how those freshmen do off the bench, so yeah. we know we know Huff can score, um, but if Stromer could come in and play the way like like he played this past weekend they're going to be feeling a whole lot better about how things look when they get into March. Yeah. I, I, uh, I was really impressed with that. I'm, I'm impressed. I mean, when you watch all these guys throughout a year uh, and you've seen it with every guy on the roster, Nemhart early on struggling to hit his shot, to find his groove mm-hmm. and kind of run the offense, they get through those things. And that's part of the, the growth of a season throughout a season. And as an individual, and as a team, you know, Braden Huff, yeah, I mean, the knock on Braden, he's scoring against the lower level teams, not yeah. much of an impact against the, the high level. He's he flipped that. He was huge against Kentucky and, and has been pretty much since, uh, you know, Anton couldn't shoot the three ball. Remember? He, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's his one weakness. He can't. Well, he's shooting 45 percent leads the team. Yep. Uh, I mean, all through Ben Gregg, we know the ups and downs. They, they, that's athletics. You go through all these ups and downs, and you have to find a way to the other side. And to see Dusty Stromer do it as a freshman, I've said it before, he's a very good all-around player. Uh, I think people just think three-point shooting when they see him. No, I, I think right. he's going to be a good rebounder. He's a good passer, good IQ, all those things. Uh, you know, a little bit in that Corey Kispert mold, but, uh, uh, and let, let's get a quick thought on Anton, Anton Watson senior night. I saw something I, I don't think I've seen, and maybe it's just because there was only one on senior night this time around. Usually it's two or three, but in warmups well before the game, uh, usually when I walk in, Luka uh, Krinovich and uh, Pavle uh, Stosic are out kind of getting individual work in with the manager or two. And they were when I first got there about, hour and 45 minutes before tip but then maybe a little over an hour before you know the other guys come out and start doing mm-hmm. their thing then they go, I think they go over to the uh, the old kennel the Martin Center do, and do yeah. some more uh, but before they did that uh, I looked out there and and all the guys most of the team was sitting on the seats where Santa Clara's bench is during the game and Anton Watson was out shooting and 
manager's tossing a ball. He's working on free throws. Like they just let him have the stage there for that's you know, awesome. Senior night. I thought it was pretty cool. And I tapped EK on the Graham EK on the shoulder. I said, "What are you guys doing?" He says, "I ah, just watching greatness." <laughs> just like matter of factly. <laughs> I just thought that was a pretty cool moment. Um, to, to I, I don't know if you were in the building or watching at home, but a uh, thunderous ovation when when Anton came down through the student section, met his family. Um, it, it, he's made a connection like very few uh, mm-hmm. Gonzaga players have. What did it look like from from your view? Yeah, it was home for it. Um... Yeah, I, I said it last week. It's just I, I'm not sure you could have uh, scripted a better way to end his career with him being a lone senior and having that stage all to himself. And um, you know, he seemed a little bit nervous maybe to start the game, but ended up having a nice performance. Um, probably the most important thing to Anton has always been getting a win, and they got that. Um, I feel like he's been a great leader this year. And the fact that he just he's been around for so long, he doesn't get too up or down. And that's been, you know, he's been consistent with that all year, especially I think in the non-conference, that was really important for this group is seeing a guy who's been, you know, played in the final four, been in a lot of big games, not reacting poorly to those struggles. Um, so, I mean, couldn't be happy for him. So, you know, disappointed he couldn't get subbed out of the game uh, just yeah. to get that one last big ovation. I know sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. Um, but all in all, it looked from my perspective and from what you know, folks I talked to that it was just a phenomenal night and really happy for him. Well deserved. Well deserved. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, move. The, let's fast forward the week ahead. Everyone wants to talk about that. Uh, yes, you know, three, three, four weeks ago, this was all the talk. If, if the Zags could get to this point still with two losses after they fell to, uh, to St. Mary's at home. And they did. It took some work. They had some, lots of ups and downs, but I think they're playing some of their best basketball now. Uh, San Francisco, the first time around, was a little bit like Santa Clara. They've got some bigs that, that the GU is going to have to deal with. Uh, Jonathan uh, Mobo, the the six eight, probably going to be the uh, you know in contention with EK for newcomer of the year and for <laughs> player of the year. He's been that good. Uh, but they've got other parts around them. They've got a really nice guard, Marcus Williams, who got caught fire at the end of the Zag game. Zags had that game, I think they were up 13 inside three minutes, and then it got tight, I think, to one possession game. They started mm-hmm. missing a bunch of free throws. But San Francisco can really guard. A little different than Santa Clara. I'd say Santa Clara is more offensive-minded, uh, like the Zags. Santa Clara, uh, San, San Francisco can really guard. The score is going to probably be in the 60s or 70s if they have their way. And – uh, maybe not as fluid offensively as Santa Clara or as many uh, options, but that's a, a lineup that's good enough to beat you. What uh, what comes to mind when you think of the keys against San Francisco? Well, look, they're seven and one in the last eight games. Uh, I watched that Sam, St. Mary's game last week. I'm not sure if that was Wednesday, but um, yeah. you know, they sh- they shot it well, 48 percent from the field, 41 from three, um, but only got to the line eight times. I don't think they probably left the gym thinking they got a great whistle and got absolutely blasted on the glass minus 13. Williams was good, but the only player in double digits with uh, with 26. Um, you know, Mobu and Newberry combined almost had a triple-double, but just only nine field goals attempted. I think sometimes that's, the, that's a head-scratcher for me, particularly Mobu. He's, uh, to your comment earlier, been you know, not only one of the best, you know, one of the best newcomers in the league, but probably one of the best players in this conference. So look in the in in the losses that San Francisco has, and they've clearly cemented themselves as no worse than the third best team in the league um, against St. Mary's and Gonzaga. They're averaging sixty six points a game, shooting forty two percent from the field, thirty from three, only ten assists. But in all their other all their wins are averaging eighty five. Yeah. They, so they, they can they can score, but they've struggled. You know, in those wins, they're shooting thirty five percent from three and eighteen assists versus just the ten. In those losses, they're they're positive on the glass versus negative. Um, it feels like a group in San Francisco that's, I mean, they're just knocking on the door to, to getting that staple win. They've been close in most of these, mm-hmm. um, you know, throughout the year. They've got some tough losses in the non-conference. Um, you know, the, in the game up in Spokane, uh, in specifically, Gonzaga's plus 11 points off turnovers, plus 13 in fast break points. Now, those two are, are, are correlated. 
but that was a big problem for the Dons up here in the kennel was coughing the ball up, um, particularly unforced turnovers, and then not be able to get back and transition slow and second down. I think that's going to be really important for them. They did a good job on the glass. They were plus nine. Yeah. Um, but Mobu only had eight points, only took six shots. He, he he just did not seem all that aggressive with his looks. I think at home he has to become more of a scorer for them. And part of that is that puts pressure defensively on Gonzaga's front line. And, you know, EK's been unbelievable this year, you know, particularly the last five games. Um, what is he? The last five games, he's averaging tw- 23.7 rebounds while shooting 67% as EK and making 17 of 20 free throw attempts, free throws yeah. attempted. If I'm Mobu, that was the matchup, have to make EK guard me. Because EK has gotten in foul trouble in the past. And obviously, if, if EK can't be on the floor, that changes Gonzaga's profile a ton. I mean, yeah. he is really you know, very much the guy they play through. Um, so I think, A, that's what the Dons would need to do. Newberry's been up and down, um, 16 points up here, but he's not consistent with it. And Marcus Williams, to your point, you know, I think he ended up with 19, but he was not efficient from the field, and a lot of that came late. Yeah. So. You know, it's, I'll be interested. The, the fact that they're playing that at the Chase Center, I, I think I can understand why they're doing that. But that's not going to feel – you know, I was down there last year when they played Gonzaga, you know, on campus. And that environment is awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't know why you, you'd move that over to the Chase Center, even if you're going to, you know, only sell the lower bowl. I'm, I, I think you're going to – it's going to – there's going to be a lot of San, Gonzaga fans at that game. Yeah. So whatever, Probably. whatever home – Probably yeah, whatever, whatever, <laughs> yeah, whatever, whatever home court advantage you had, it's gone, in my opinion. And whatever um, that does for you as a group, you know, you're not going to be able to recreate that at, at the Chase Center. So, but look, yeah. that's a that's a San Francisco team that's more than capable of beating Gonzaga. There's no doubt Gonzaga. You know, they have they're going to have Gonzaga's attention. You know what you what you hope for is Gonzaga's not. And I don't think they would. Nothing about what they've done this year would do this. But you know, it's. You've got St. Mary's 48 hours later. It, it can be hard sometimes. It's human nature to be thinking about that game. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think Gonzaga wants to come out with a slow start against the Dons. No, and I, I Mark Few mentioned it after the last game. Uh, they've had a great ability to stay on the opponent right in front of them. Uh, be very big this week because if they get that one on Thursday, if the Zags win that one, that probably takes quite a bit of pressure off the shoulders with getting the second seed. Obviously there's enormous pressure still there <laughs> trying to uh, mm-hmm. secure that at large uh, resume, but I think they would have a, a little bit of a, uh, uh, of a, you know, a breath to take there for, for a few minutes before they zero in on, on St. Mary's, but uh, what, 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 is the San Francisco, would the San Francisco game be game be considered quad two right now? Do you know? No. No, because uh, uh, for the for the net, they're counting it as a road game for Gonzaga and a home game for San Francisco. So they're and, making quad one then. Yeah, and, okay. and that's quad one because they're. I still think they're in the fifties in the net. And they yeah, can. Yeah, yeah. They've yeah. got some leeway now, all the way up to seventy, I think, for that to stay that way. So, yeah, that that's a big deal for for both teams, really. Uh, let's uh, move on. St. Mary's, uh, the arch enemy of, of Gonzaga and the WCC. Zags have had, uh, uh, you know, dominated the series uh, numerically through the years, but the Gales have always found a way to, to, to get a win here and there against the Zags. They've broken Gonzaga's uh, consecutive streaks for uh, winning the league. They broke through at the WCC tournament. Again, not often, but enough to make it uh, 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 one of the better rivalries on the West Coast. And they got the Zags in Spokane, 64-62. Uh, about a month ago or so that game was very much uh, St. Mary's uh, how they play Uh, Zags didn't play poorly at at all they just had a real dry spell late in that game Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that was when Graham E.K. got in foul trouble and went to the bench St. Mary's I think had eight in a row went from three down to five up and GU just couldn't make up the difference Zags didn't play poorly they didn't play out of their mind but they played okay but they weren't able to do the things offensively that we've kind of seen. They had five assists. Uh, you know, they, they didn't dominate the paint uh, that we see most nights out and really a bad night on the three balls. I think that was one of their worst 
shooting. Yeah, three or fourteen. Three or that's, fourteen. To me, that's the crux of the issue. You're you're not going to go score ninety in Moraga, but can no. you be efficient? Can you be balanced? Can Nolan keep hitting? Benny keep hitting the three? Can you get that twenty point night out of EK? And can Nemhard run the show? Even if he scores eight, ten points, can he have those six, seven assists? Uh, what's the secret to to kind of being you when you're playing a team that doesn't let you be you most of the time? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I it's uh, it's been the rare occurrence where Gonzaga has been able to impose their tempo and style of play on St. Mary's. I mean, that's a real credit. I think to the Gales and, and Bennett, um, that's a that's going to be an awesome environment. And you know what I what I look at is just the matchups here are as good Tremendous. as they get. Quite frankly, uh, mm -hmm. you look at Ek and Saxon inside. Saxon's playing his butt off right now. Last uh, last weekend, averaged twenty and ten while yeah. uh, shooting sixty four percent from the field, and he's making his free throws all of a sudden. Yeah, who's um, he think he is? Ek, what's the deal here? You know. <laughs> Uh, Marcelonis, you know, Nemhard, probably, you know, no, clearly the two best point guards in the league. Um, you know, Nemhard has the ball a little bit more in his hands, but his assist totals, uh, him being uh, Mar Marcelonis, is, his assist to turn ratio is just as equally as impressive. And he's been shooting the ball uh, a lot better in conference play when you think about, you know, he kind of came out of the gate a little slower. Hickman, Mahaney. Um, very, just, yeah. you know, kind of, you know, very similar players. Uh, two guys who I think, uh, you know, Mahaney last year and Hickman last year both were on the point a lot, and maybe, um, Mahaney had a little bit more success, but he's been better now with Marcelona's kind of running point. Hickman, much the same with Nemhard. You know, go down the list. What's going to be interesting, I think, is the the big the big difference I thought for St. Mary's up in Spokane was the play of Jefferson. He was the equal all of the equal of, of watson that night you know played all 40 minutes um watson did the same i mean i'm looking at it now jefferson 16 points watson 16 points <laughs> watson 10 rebounds jefferson 11 rebounds really you know because watson in a lot of ways is the type of player that bothers st mary's historically but with jefferson on the floor he's gone now or at least he hasn't put playing if he's let's see if he's, if no, he's, he's available on saturday year, okay so now you've got a real advantage, but interestingly enough, Dukas, who I don't think scores up here in Spokane, now the last five game, games is averaging 17 a game, seven rebounds, and I, this is real, shooting 62% on three with real volume. So now that's a different matchup for Anton. You know, my presumption is that's where that's where they stick him to start. He plays – Dukas is very, a very different player than Jefferson. Not nearly the – you know, the, the athlete doesn't have the strength, but he can stretch it in the way Jefferson does it. So, I don't know, Jim. This is – I love the matchup between the two. It's a great – if you love coaching and love watching – trying to trying to understand the strategy, you're yeah. not going to find two better guys than you and Bennett. Um, and it, both those guys will change things up during the middle of the game. But if you're asking me what the key is, you know, I think for Gonzaga, it's going to be, A, you've got to rebound the ball. You've got to limit St. Mary's second chance opportunities. You know, St. Mary's doesn't, I mean, you might argue they have less depth than Gonzaga does. So if you can pin a ch some cheap fouls on Saxon, the quality behind him is dramatically lower than what Gonzaga has in, in, if, if, say, EK gets in foul trouble. Um, and then you've got to make shots. Um, you know, that's been the story all year. Um, you know, you, you, you would expect a team who struggles to, sh to shoot the ball from three to, to struggle in those games and lose some of them. But Gonzaga, when they lose, they don't just struggle from three. They completely forget the how to shoot. I mean, it is, it's dramatic. Those, those 20%, 17%, right? Yeah. So even if you're not shooting it well from three, you've got to be around 30%, I think. You've got to find some points on the perimeter, but um, it's awesome. I love how the league, I, you know, it feels like the last several years, the la last game of the year but for these two schools is against each other, and they alternate either up down in Moraga or up in Spokane, and there's always been a lot on the line. And, you know, Gonzaga is not, not likely to win the league here, but that game is as important as if, if they were trying to win the league. They, yeah. they need, if, I think if they get – if they sweep this weekend – I really believe that regardless of what happens in the conference tournament, they're in. Yeah, and that, I agree with and, you. And, and, yeah, and and that's the sigh of relief you want. You, yeah. you, you would love to have that that pressure kind of gone. 
if yeah. you're Gonzaga, I think. That's that's the words I was looking for. Sigh of relief when I was bumbling through that sentence <laughs> a little bit ago. Uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, they sweep. I, I think they're in great standing for for an at-large. Probably want to get your semifinal win there before the, the title game. Yeah, Vegas, probably fair enough. But fair maybe enough. not even that. So we'll, we'll see how it turns out. Foxy, let's hit uh, real quick. Kind of the topics of uh, of the NCAA right now, mm-hmm. uh, and we'll just get maybe a quick thought if you have one on. Uh, they're talking about expanding the tournament again from sixty eight. That's been mm-hmm. coming up more and more. Uh, I can summarize my feeling on it real quick as a get off my lawn type of human. Uh, <laughs> no, do not do that. Leave it as it is. When you've got something that's magical and works year after year don't mess with it so that topic and then court storming we saw kyle filipowski for duke get uh, a knee injury when wake forest beat uh, duke Mm -hmm. Uh, court storming fan caught him in the knee not sure how severe it is i've been in a lot of those because whenever gonzaga loses on the road in the wcc which isn't very often uh here come the fans santa clara this year anton watson you remember had a cramp on the last play was kind of trying to hobble towards the Gonzaga bench. He was about five feet from getting caught up in a swarm at midcourt. Uh, who knows how that had turned out. So uh, quick thought on 68 teams. Let's, let's make it, you know, 350. Let's just get them all in there. Right. Yeah. No. Uh, Way in court storming. <laughs> it's the time for that to go away. Yeah. Well, as my father told me eloquently a while back, um, I can't use all the words. He says, don't mess with happy. <laughs> Um, look, I the think Mark is, you borrowed uh, that, by the way. Uh, the the tournament is, and, and I certainly have a bias, but I think it's you know, a, a, an opinion that's universally um, supported. It, it's the greatest sporting event in American sports. It just is it's better than the Super Bowl. It's better than anything else. Um, and I have a tough time understanding why there's this urge. But then I remember it's about the money. And, and then the I, power schools want yeah. 10 of their teams in from their conference instead of seven or eight. Yeah. But, but a lot of that, it's all about money. And um, if you needed further evidence that the, um, the NCAA is an ineffective organization and that college sports is not about the student athlete, then that would be, you know, exhibit 55 of my case. So um, I think it's going to happen. There's no doubt about it. You know, it's uh, it's absurd. There's 360 some odd teams in Division One anyway. That's you know, that's a whole other podcast on its own. Um, but they're going to make this somewhere in the 90s. You know, and it's just going to dilute the product. And and I can tell you, someone who, um, you know, don't tell my clients, but will be magically unavailable for meetings on that first Thursday <laughs> and Friday. That if they expand the tournament, I'll be available for Thursday Friday meetings, the first and second round when number the the 22nd seed is playing the first seed. It's just yeah, not as compelling. We'll still probably have play-in games too at that point. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, with respect to the uh, the court storming, <laughs> yeah, look, it, it's been a part of college athletics or sports generally forever. Um, I, I've never been a fan of it. You know, it, it, the fact that there, A, haven't been more incidents like the one we saw with Duke um, or B, quite frankly, confrontations. Yeah. Um, th- like that's, you're, you are, it's going to happen. It's going to happen We either an athlete or a student gets severely injured. It's going to happen where you've got um, intoxicated students coming onto the floor thinking that they can um, say something to so-and-so, and that athlete is going to not agree with that and probably do something about it. And now you're going to have 300, 500 people on the floor, and you're going to have a melee, and there's no way you can slow that down. So... Um, I think until you see something like that, it's probably just going to be a lot of lip service. You know, the one thing I, I would say is the fines, and we all saw this over the weekend, the fines associated with court stormings and these conferences, I don't believe the ACC even has one. Um, you know, money talks, and I think if all of a sudden it gets awfully expensive um, after those, then I think um, you might see some some corrective action. But also, you know, the other thing I would say, too, is, look, we go to the, a lot of these Gonzaga games, and these are really, these are amazing people that do the c- crowd control. But none of them are going to be hired to be a bouncer. Okay, these are folks that either, I mean, this is not even a side hustle. I mean, these are folks that are making a little bit of money, but and they're enjoying what they do. 
but they're not there to slow down a 22 year old college student who, you know, weighs 225 pounds. I mean, they can't do that. No. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's having plans in place delay. You know, can you, can you talk to your student athlete, your, your student body? Can you, you know, say, Hey, let's give this, the opposed the, the opposition 20 seconds to leave the floor. You know, do you have to have an understanding with the teams, you know, Hey Duke, if you lose, you know, go to the closest sideline. I don't know, but it's yeah. it's uh, it's certainly something bad's really going to happen, Jim. And no. uh, until that happens, I'm not sure that, that any real solutions are going to be provided. No, and and something bad might have already happen to Filipowski, who's yeah, no, no, no doubt, no doubt, and a possible first round guy, probable first round guy. Uh, fix the thing now, or address it now before you, as you mentioned, something extremely serious could happen. I mean, that's a bad combination when you've got hundreds of students emboldened by perhaps a, a beer or two and uh, a team that has just lost a very tough game. You know, that's another part of it. it they're, they're not real pleased either, having dropped a four-point game or whatever it was at Wake Forest. Mm -hmm. Let's address it now before it becomes an issue that, uh, well, it's some regrettable outcomes and uh, right. i'm not sure what the answer is but i would think if you could almost put up a some kind of mini barrier or make an announcement hey let's give them one minute to shake hands and leave and or even forgo shaking hands just we're going to let them exit the court and then you guys can storm the floor if not we've got video from every angle we're going to catch you on video and you are going to be uh, subject to some, you know, you're not coming to any more games, you're getting fined, you're getting charged, whatever it is, some kind of uh, 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 deterrent uh, uh, to to stop it, but uh, it needs to stop. It's just too dangerous of a situation. Heck, I'm not even in them. I'm on the sideline, and it's it's a little unsettling when you've got kids flying over tables and mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and just you know all to get out to mid mid court. So. Yeah, it's something I hopefully uh, they get addressed in uh, uh, in the near future because it's going to happen. You're going to get to these final rivalry games. That really could happen. So, hey, that's going to do it for this week. Big week ahead. San Francisco on Thursday. St. Mary's on Saturday. A lot to be decided. Uh, Foxy and I will be back with you next Monday to, to recap it all. Thanks for joining us and have a good week. See you back next Monday.